subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from the UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Now today let us discuss the important news appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 29th June 2022. These are the list of the news for today's discussion and timestamp has been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from prelims and mains point of view. Now this article appearing on page number 9 in the article section says that bring the shine back on government jobs. Instead of expanding contractual employment, we should seek to bolster public services. So this article basically highlights about the pitfalls of contractual employment along with various illustrations. Now these illustrations highlight as to how the nature of contractual employment has increased within the public services over a period of years. And because of increased contractual employment given to public, they are at the mercy of the government to be fired at any point of time. Apart from this, those employees who get hired through contractual employment also do not get the benefits of pension and other social security benefits. And to worsen their problems, the Supreme Court has ruled that contractual employee of any department or ministry or of the government is not a public servant. So these are some of the important issues, particularly with respect to the aspect of contractual employment has been highlighted in this article along with certain examples which we will go through. Now apart from this, the article further says that instead of downsizing contractual employment, the government need to expand its public services across sectors instead of expanding contractual employment over a period of years. And there is also a need to shift from the idea of universal basic income towards a universal basic services program supported by the government. Now UNESCO in one of its papers have highlighted that under the concept of universal basic services, the provision of free public services must go beyond health or education so that it also cover other basic necessities such as housing, care, transport, information and also nutrition. And based on this idea of universal basic services, the author has highlighted the pitfall which was apparent because of COVID-19 as under investment in public goods and services including health was quite visible. So overall, the article suggests that instead of government going after contractual employment, it should rather go for universal basic services as the idea of universal basic services not only has the potential to create jobs, but the whole idea in itself is more egalitarian and has a strong redistributive performance and impact on income inequalities thereby fulfilling the mandate as provided under Article 39B and 39C, which is a part of Directive Principles of State Policy. So after understanding the backdrop to this article, let's go through some of the illustrations which has been provided in this article with respect to increase in share of contractual employment within public services. And also let us understand that how this idea of universal basic services will not only provide employment in different sectors of the economy, but it will also help to fulfill the directive principles as stated under Article 39B and 39C of the Indian Constitution. Now this topic becomes an important topic particularly from the mains perspective and gets covered with respect to GS Paper 3 under aspect and issues on Indian economy and also the aspect of social justice under GS Paper 2. Now the idea of universal basic services as proposed by UNESCO is an alternative to universal basic income which is based on cash transfers to certain section of the population. So the universal basic services advocates a wider range of free public services enabling every citizen to meet their basic needs and achieve certain levels of security, opportunity and participation. And according to the paper published by UNESCO, there are certain core principles with respect to UBS. First is universal. So universal refers to guaranteed entitlement according to need and not one's ability to pay. Second is basic, it means sufficient rather than minimal, thereby enabling people to meet their basic needs, participate in society and also flourish. 
and services refer to collectively generated activities that serve the public interest. And because of this, the article suggests that promoting a universal basic services programs, particularly with respect to health, education and even other aspects, will not only improve the delivery services but also result in generation of employment and overall it will help to achieve the principles laid down in Article 39, which is a part of Directive Principle of State Policy. So it says that the state shall in particular direct its policy towards securing that citizens, men and women equally have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. 39b. That ownership and control of material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. 39c. That the operation of the economic system does not result in concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment. And overall, the idea of universal basic services will help to reduce inequality in the society. Thus, based on this understanding of universal basic services, let us go through some of the illustrations with respect to the problems of contractual employment as has been highlighted in this article and also let's go through the suggestions as has been provided with respect to implementation of universal basic services not only in order to improve the quality of services but also to generate employment in various sectors of the Indian economy. Thus, this problem of contractual hiring has led to increased protest across the country in different states. And because of lack of recruitment by various government agencies and departments, it is leading to joblessness, poverty and even bankruptcy. And as per the data of NCRB, that is National Crime Records Bureau, which functions under the Ministry of Home Affairs, it says that between the period of 2018 to 20, 25,000 people committed suicide because of the reasons of joblessness, poverty and bankruptcy. And these aspects of joblessness, poverty and bankruptcy have also increased protest across country, including the protest which we saw with respect to Agnipath scheme. Now when a state government or central government issues notification for contractual employment, then it becomes very easy for the government either to hire and fire as per it wishes and also it can restrict certain benefits regarding pension, bonus, allowances, etc. So it's basically a win-win situation for the government. And because of this, the contractual employment across government sectors has increased. Now let's go through some of the examples which has been provided in this article. The government of Haryana fired over 2,000 contractual health workers who were hired during the COVID pandemic. These health workers include nurses, sweepers, paramedicals and also lab technicians. Similar was the case with respect to Delhi in government hospitals such as Ram Manohar Lohia, Lady Hardinge, as these hospitals fired contractual workers such as lab technicians because during the COVID time there was increased demand to test for COVID. Nurses were also fired including paramedical staff. Now talking about Assam, approx 8300 contractual workers or staffs protested because their services have not been regularized for the past 12 to 14 years. So it means that they have been working as contractual employees for the past 12 to 14 years, yet the government has not made them permanent. And because of this, they have not received any pay revision, they have not received any bonus or any pension. So with respect to these contractual workers, the government has a slight edge as they can not only restrict their financial aspect, but also terminate their employment if they violate any provisions of the contract. Now similarly with respect to Chhattisgarh, it says that the contractual workers of state electricity department who were protesting against the nature of employment were caned and also arrested. So lack of employment has led to increased protests especially over jobs and this has resulted in destruction of government properties and at times it also leads to some of the death of protesters. Now the article highlights about two important reasons for these increased protests. First reason is that vacancies are not filled within the government sectors or agencies or departments within adequate time as there is still over 60 lakh vacancies pending at all level in the government which are not filled. And whatever recruitment is taking place within different states, these recruitments are mostly happening for contractual workers. So example highlighted here is that in 2014, 43% of government employees were contractual workers, which were close to 12.3 million workers. And out of these 12.3 million workers, 6.9 million worked in key flagship schemes of the government such as Anganwari. Further among the CPSEs, that is Central Public Sector Enterprises, 
contractual workers increased from 19% to 37% as per March 2020. And in ONGC itself, more than 81% of the employees are contractual employees or contractual workers. Now, recently, the UP government has made certain amendment with respect to employment for Group B and Group C employees. And this is with respect to their contractual employment, which is only for a period of five years. And regularization of job will take place only for those select people who pass a very rigorous performance appraisal test. So these are some of the issues which has been highlighted in this article, especially pertaining to contractual workers. So based on these examples, the article concludes by saying that rather than expanding the contractual employment by government and various government agencies and departments, it is time to expand universal basic services. Now, universal basic services means providing basic services such as health, education, nutrition, water waste management facilities to citizens. And through expansion of the universal basic services to the citizens, it will not only cater to the overall development, but it will also lead to creation of more jobs. So there is a need to expand universal basic services in the fields of health, education, renewable power generation, water waste treatment facility, and also solid waste management, adoption for electric vehicles to expand green mobility, and also for urban farming, especially with respect to permaculture, which is an innovative framework for sustainable way of living, gardening and also nursery management. So for all these purposes, the article suggests that there is a need to expand universal basic services for these different sectors, as this will not only improve these different sectors, but it will also generate income for the people. Now, apart from this, other areas of reform as suggested in this article include reforming the public sector undertakings and providing them with greater autonomy, not only with respect to decision making, but also staff selection. Further, there is a need to hire more specialists in government services, such as doctors, engineers, architects, and even teachers. And finally, there is also need to reform civil services to cater to the modern challenges, particularly with respect to providing corruption-free welfare system and improved public delivery system for public services. So these reforms, as suggested, will not only attract better talent in these different sectors, but it will also improve the overall public delivery services of the government, including delivery of government services and its important welfare schemes. The next news to be taken up also appears in the article section on page number 9. Now this article highlights about section 62 clause 5 of the Representation of People Act 1951, which prevents or prohibits under trials and also convicts from right to vote. And this aspect of right to vote has been discussed by us on 14 June 2022 very recently. So based on this understanding of Section 62 Clause 5 of RPA, as you can see, it says that no person shall vote at any election if he is confined in a prison. Now this article basically highlights that the term confined is very ambiguous and it includes not only under trials but also convicts. However, on the other hand, it does not include such accused who are out on bail. So those persons who are out on bail can vote in an election. But those accused who are under trials, they cannot vote in an election. So this article says that there is an anomaly with respect to section 62 clause 5 and overall this provision regarding right to vote needs to be constitutionally examined by the Supreme Court. Now, amidst the ongoing Maharashtra crisis, two MLAs who were detained by ED, that is Enforcement Directorate, asked to vote. However, the ED refused them the right to vote as per Section 62, Clause 5. So, it is in this regard, this article highlights or raises the issue of anomaly with respect to the term confinement as has been used under Section 62, Clause 5 of Representation of People Act 1951, which deals with right to vote. So the issues raised is that under this particular provision, that is 62 clause 5, the term confinement has been used and not conviction as a yardstick for disenfranchisement. Hence, Supreme Court, which has agreed to look into the various aspects of section 62, needs to understand the separation between under trials and also those accused out on bail. Because for both these categories of accused, their crime has yet not been proved. 
So overall, this article highlights that Section 62, Clause 5 of Representation of People Act 1951 goes against the principle of Article 14, which provides for reasonable classification as it treats the same class of persons or we can say accused, namely the under trials and also those out on bail on a different note. As under trials are not allowed to vote, whereas those accused who are out on bail are allowed to vote. Now further in this analysis, a comparative note has also been provided. So for example in UK, only convicts who are sentenced to a prison of 4 years or more cannot vote. So again the term here is convict which means their crime has already been proven by the court of law. Now regarding Germany, it says that persons convicted of certain political offences are disenfranchised. Whereas regarding Canada, its law basically restricted all prisoners from voting and it was struck down by their constitutional court for being arbitrary and disproportionate. So the same aspect of arbitrariness with respect to treating different class of accused namely the under trial and those who are out on bail on a different notion becomes problematic and can be said to be violative of article 14 of the Indian constitution. So the Supreme Court while going through the petition of the MLAs of Maharashtra has agreed to examine the constitutionality of section 62 clause 5 of RPA in the wake of MLAs not allowed to vote as they were undergoing trial. Now as per the news of today, the Maharashtra government might have to prove their majority on the floor of the house and in such situation also if those MLAs who are as under trials are not allowed to vote then this may also impact the sustenance of the government. So on all these note, it becomes very important for the Supreme Court to examine the constitutionality of section 62 clause 5 and thereby determine such accused or convicts who does not have the right to vote according to representation of People Act of 1951. So effectively it's up to the Supreme Court to decide which voter is allowed to exercise their right to vote and how to rationally exclude the different kinds of accused. For example, those accused who are undergoing trial, those accused who are convicted and those accused who are out on bail in criminal cases. So there is a need for reasonable classification and also rational ground on which these different kinds of accused can either be disallowed or allowed with respect to right to vote under section 62 clause 5 of Representation of People Act 1951. Now on 14 June, the day on which we discuss this particular aspect that is section 62 clause 5 of RPA 1951, we also discuss article 326 which provides for the right to vote for such citizens who is not less than 18 years of age. And we also discussed about a UPSC prelims question asked in 2017 where the question was right to vote and to be elected in India is a options were fundamental right, natural right, constitutional right and legal right. And as you know, the correct answer here was constitutional right because of the provisions of Article 326 of the Indian Constitution. So let us wait for the Supreme Court to finally determine the constitutionality of Section 62 Clause 5 of Representation of People Act as it needs to define the term confinement and also those kinds of accused who are not allowed to vote. And this topic becomes important both from your prelims and mains perspective with respect to polity and governance under Representation of People Act 1951 and its important features. Now the next two news to be taken up appears on page number 16 in the business section and on page number 11 in the text and context section. Now this news on the text and context section says that GST reform needs a new grand bargain and the GST compensation issue strengthens the necessity for a new system between sovereign and sub-sovereign entities. Now here the sub-sovereign entities have been referred to the states. And the issue highlighted here is regarding the GST compensation cess as the central government is unable to pay GST compensation cess to the states. Now GST was a bold reform which led to one nation one tax structure. And because of GST, the state governments had to undergo various taxes which was also a source of their revenue. So in order to compensate for these sources of revenue, the central government agreed to provide them a GST compensation cess for the next five years from the day GST was implemented. However, because of COVID-19 and various other issues pertaining to Indian economy, there have been problems in payment of GST compensation cess. So it is in this regard, this article suggests in the text and context section 
that considering the GST compensation issue, there is a need to restructure the whole GST aspect. Now, based on this understanding, this particular article on page number 16 says that the rate adjustment looms as GST council meets. Now, today the GST council is supposed to meet and according to certain section of the media, there is a probability that the government may rationalize some of the taxes. Now, the issue highlighted in page number 16 is regarding the revenue neutral rate. Now, change in tax structure is said to be revenue neutral. If the modified tax, that is the GST, is able to collect the same amount of revenue which was being collected earlier. So this news highlights that revenue mobilization from GST is falling short of targets due to decrease in average revenue neutral rate from 15.5% to 11.6%. So it basically means that prior to the coming of GST, the average tax rate was 15.5%. And after coming of GST, this has decreased to mere 11.6%. And hence, the tax rate from GST collection cannot be said to be revenue neutral. Because prior to GST, the average tax rate was higher as compared to coming into effect of GST. So it says that revenue mobilization from GST is falling short of targets due to decrease in average revenue neutral rate from 15.5% to 11.6% on account of multiple rate cuts since the introduction of GST in July 2017. It further highlights that even the share of general government's revenue from taxes subsumed under GST was 6.3% of GDP in 2016-17. However, this tax collection decreased to 5.7% of GDP in 2018-19 and it further declined to 5.6% in 2019-20. So we understand that constantly the revenue earned through GST has been declining and because of this the central government is unable to provide GST compensation says to the states. So after understanding the aspect of revenue neutral rate, let's go through some of the suggestions as a form of grand bargain which has been highlighted in this article on text and context section. So this article says that states have been left out on the promise of reimbursement on shortfall of revenue. And this is because of significant drop in tax collection by the central government. And the fact that central government is abdicating its responsibility to make up for the shortfall in 14% growth in GST revenues to the states. And this has been done by using a clause referred as force majeure or act of God or due to an unnatural event which could not have been foreseen. So states have been left out on the promises of reimbursement on shortfall of revenue. So the article says that abdication of responsibility by the central government puts the state governments in jeopardy because states have limited options to raise revenue, especially after the coming into effect of GST as compared to the central government. Article 293 of the Indian constitution prohibits state to raise loan from outside the country unless it is guaranteed by the central government. Further, center can command much lower borrowing rates from the market as compared to the state governments. Because of decline in revenue of the state governments, it is further increasing their indebtedness of states, which is further impacting their loan raising ability in the future. Now, we all know that COVID-19 impacted economy in a negative way. And presently, we are witnessing increased inflation because of which RBI has constantly increased the repo rate. So it is in this backdrop the article suggests that the macroeconomic stabilization is the sole responsibility of the central government and hence center should provide adequate compensation to the states in case of shortfall in revenue. The last and the most important point highlighted in this article is regarding the increasing trust deficit between center and states because the center is refusing to reimburse states on the shortfall of their revenue. And this increased mistrust between center and state further endangers cooperative federalism in India. So as a part of suggestion, the article in the text and context section suggests for a grand bargain. So it says that merely tinkering with the rates, changing the tax slabs or increased cess for the center as it cannot be shared with the states will not help. And there is a need to widen tax base that is include more products within the GST range. Further, there is a need to fix a standard GST rate of 12% for at least 5 consecutive years. Now, example has been highlighted with respect to Australia 
as for the last two decades, Australia's GST rate has been at constant 10%. So based on this example of Australia, this article suggests that India can have a single rate of 12% and this single GST slab should also cover petrol, diesel, electricity, transport and even real estate. Now as of now, there are various GST rates applicable on different products. For example, the GST rates ranges from 0.25% till 28%. So it is in this backdrop this article suggests that there is a need for a single slab rate of 12% and this should also cover those products which are not covered under GST such as petrol, diesel, electricity, transport and real estate. It further says that there is a need for some extra elbow room for states to raise their own revenue. Now another very important point highlighted in this article is that there is a need to ensure revenue autonomy even for local bodies, that is for panchayats and municipalities. So it says that of the 12% of GST rate, which is to be fixed, 10% should be equally shared between states and the central government, whereas the remaining 2% must be earmarked exclusively for the urban and rural local bodies. So these are some of the suggestions which have been provided in the text and context section regarding a grand bargain. And here it has also suggested that merely tinkering the rates in order to adjust revenue neutrality will not help in the longer term. Now these are some of the benefits with respect to the suggestions provided in the article. It says that a moderate single rate of 12% will encourage better compliance from the consumers. It will reduce the need to do arbitrary classification and discretion. It will reduce litigation and it will also lead to tax buoyancy or buoyancy in tax collection. Now regarding tax buoyancy, it says that when a tax is buoyant, its revenue increases without increasing the tax rate. So definitely there is a relationship with the GDP. So it highlights that tax buoyancy explains the relationship between changes in government's tax revenue growth and changes in GDP. And it refers to a responsiveness of tax revenue growth to changes in GDP. So when a tax is buoyant, its revenue increases without changing or without increasing the tax rate. So the tax revenue increases without tinkering or changing the rate of tax. And lastly, it says that this will avoid adjusting revenue neutral rate issues because of better compliance and tax buoyancy. So these are some of the benefits which have been highlighted regarding these suggestions in this particular article. Now coming back to the news on page number 16, the GST council today is supposed to meet to decide on various aspects and according to media reports it says that it has accepted the recommendation of group of ministers headed by Karnataka CM Baswa Raj Bomai, especially on the rate rationalization to improve GST collections and some of its recommendations include first withdrawal of exemptions on certain goods and services, second rationalization of rates in terms of placing certain goods and services in the higher tax bracket. So the government intends to put some of the goods or services to a higher tax bracket for better tax collection. Now a few days back we were discussing about the tax rate on cotton textile mills and we discussed that as of now the tax rate on cotton was 5% however the government was planning to increase to 12%. So after the meeting of GST council we will know that which products have been put into a higher tax bracket. Now another set of recommendations include addressing inverted duty structure in GST. Now regarding inverted tax structure, suppose the final tax rate is 5% that is the final GST rate is 5% whereas the input rate on different products is say 12%. So this refers to an inverted tax rate that is on the raw material it is charging extra tax whereas on the finished product the tax rate is less. So for example, GST applicable on inputs such as cloth fabric used for manufacturing cloth bags may be 12%, while GST applicable on finished goods, that is cloth bag, could be 5%. So this is an example of an inverted duty structure, which is the raw material are charged a higher tax duty as compared to the finished products. So the GST council meet will also address the issue of inverted duty structure in GST. So let us wait for the final outcome of the GST council meeting. Now both these articles become important from the perspective of GS paper 3 under Indian economy.
Now let's take up the next news appearing on page number 8 in the article section. Now this says remembering the plan man of India. Revisiting country's statistical inheritance from PC Mahalanobis assumes importance in today's data driven world. Now this article with respect to India's plan man becomes important as you can see in the year 2019 in GS paper 3. This particular question was asked. The question was, how was India benefited from the contributions of Sir M. Visvesaraya and Dr. M. S. Swaminathan in the fields of water engineering and agricultural science, respectively? So similar questions can be asked with respect to the development of statistics in India and also the important contribution of P. C. Mahalanobis in Indian society. So recognizing the contributions of P. C. Mahalanobis in the fields of statistics and economic planning. the government of india has declared today that is 29 june as statistics day as this day also coincides with the birth anniversary of pc mahalanobis so the objective of statistics day is to create public awareness especially in younger generation so that they are drawn or inspired from the professor about the role and importance of statistics in socio economic planning and policy formulation for the country as we know that issues in the present time are regarding data collection and also quality of such data which are published so on this note let's go through some of the important contribution of pc mahalanobis in indian society so pc mahalanobis was a statistician and a genius and he developed the concepts of mahalanobis distance which is a distance between two points in multivariate space with respect to statistics so he devised a measure of comparison between two data sets that is now known as mahanalobis distance now he also created the concept of random sampling now random sampling is a part of sampling technique in which each sample has an equal probability of being chosen so this random sample is basically meant to be an unbiased representation of total population and pc mahanalobis introduced innovative techniques to conduct large scale sample surveys and calculated averages and crop yields by using the method of random sampling further he also contributed in the development of fractile graphical analysis now this can be used to compare socio economic conditions of different groups of people and he also applies statistics to economic planning for flood control now pc mahanalobis also had great contribution towards institution buildings in india as established national sample survey in 1950 and also the central statistical organization further he was also a member of the planning commission and the second five year plan of india is also known as the mahanalobis plan so it highlights that planning commission's second five year plan encouraged the development of heavy industry in india and also relied on mahanalobis mathematical description of indian economy which later came to be known as the mahanalobis model and it is because of the contributions of pc mahalanobis indian statistical institute which is a higher education and research institute has been recognized as an institute of national importance so these can be said to be some of the contributions of pc mahalanobis now the government is also celebrating the statistics day and the theme for statistics day 2022 is data for sustainable development so you can go through this article as it highlights about pc mahanalobis and his close relationship with rabindranath tagore so the whole idea of discussing this article is that if a question is asked on the contributions of the plan man of india then you are able to write a 10 marker or even a 15 marker answer now the next two news to be taken up appears in the text and context section on page number 10 The first news mentions about the G7 plan to counter the Belt and Road Initiative and this plan is Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment that is PGII so it says that how is the partnership for global infrastructure and investment going to enhance development in low and middle income countries so this article highlights about the announcement made by president Joe Biden of United States and his G7 allies to counter the belt and road initiative of china now us aims to counter the belt and road initiative of china as the us and its allies believes that through bri china is trying to increase its influence and because of easy loan available at low interest countries such as sri lanka and even pakistan are being debt trapped so to counter the bri that is belt and road initiative of china The United States and its allies including the G7 countries has launched a partnership for global infrastructure and investment. 
and this project is basically to develop infrastructure in a transparent way in the low and middle income earning countries. So it says that PGII aims to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative to build connectivity infrastructure and trade projects in Asia, Europe, Africa and Latin America. Now the Belt and Road Initiative was based on two concepts. First, a Silk Road economic belt on land and also a maritime 21st century Silk Road. And through the Belt and Road Initiative, China initially restricted itself to Southeast Asia, but later this project was expanded to not only South and Central Asia, but also outside Asia towards Europe, Africa and Latin America. And it is because of this, United States and its allies including European Union and G7 members believes that through the Belt and Road Initiative, China is trying to expand its area of influence. And to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, it has launched a partnership for global infrastructure and investment. Now, earlier in 2021, United States along with G7 partners, namely UK, Japan, France, Canada, Germany, Italy and European Union had announced launch of Build Back Better World or B3W plan. So the new initiative of PGII is basically a rework of B3W plan. And through this initiative, the G7 members aim to collectively mobilize $600 billion by 2021 to invest in sustainable and quality infrastructure in developing countries including India and also to strengthen global supply chains. Now individually, the United States has pledged $200 billion in grants, public financing and private capital over the next five years for PGII and the European Union has committed 300 billion euros for this particular initiative also for the next five years. Now as a transparent mechanism and also to develop green future, this project will be driven by four priority pillars that will define the second half of 21st century. So according to the initiative, the four priority pillars are first to tackle climate crisis and ensure global energy security through clean energy supply chain. Now this is in contrast with BRI that is Belt and Road Initiative as most of the projects under BRI are to fund coal based power plants. The next pillar under PGII is that this project will focus on bolstering digital information and communication technology networks thereby facilitating technology such as 5G and 6G internet connectivity and also cyber security. The third pillar is that this project aims to advance gender equality and equity and fourth to build and upgrade global healthcare infrastructure. So these are the four priority pillars of partnership for global infrastructure and investment. Now under PGII, there are a number of projects which are already in function. So the United States International Development Finance Corporation along with G7 nations and EU are disbursing $3.3 million technical assistance grant to build vaccine facility in Senegal, which will have potential yearly capacity to manufacture millions of doses for COVID-19 and other vaccines. Another project which is already functioning is European Commission's Global Gateway Initiative and this is also undertaking projects including PGII such as mRNA vaccine plants in Latin America and a fiber optic cable linking Europe to Latin America among others. Now in India, the United States International Development Finance Corporation will invest up to $30 million in Omnivore Agritech and Climate Sustainability Fund which is an impact venture capital fund that invests in entrepreneurs building the future of agriculture, food systems, climate and rural economy in India. So these are some of the projects already functioning under the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Now the PGII has been initiated as a response to the Belt and Road Initiative. So on this note, let's go through a comparative analysis of Belt and Road Initiative and the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Now regarding the objective, as we have stated that the objective of BRI was to revive connectivity, trade and infrastructure along China's ancient Silk Road. And this was initiated as Silk Road Economic Belt on Land and also Maritime 21st Century Silk Road. Whereas PGII as a value based plan aims to provide underfunded low and middle income countries to meet their infrastructural needs in a transparent manner. 
Now regarding climate energy, China has built large coal-fired plants under BRI along with solar, hydro and wind energy projects, whereas PGII focuses mainly on climate action and clean energy developments. Now regarding the funding amount, G7 has pledged $600 billion by 2027. However, by this time, it is estimated that China's funding for BRI would reach close to 1.2 or even 1.3 trillion dollars. Regarding funding type, China's BRI is majorly state funded and most of the Chinese work under the infrastructure projects of BRI. Whereas under PGII, large private capital will also be mobilized apart from state funds. Now regarding debt trap, China has faced the criticism of debt trap diplomacy meaning the countries to whom China lends loan, they are not able to repay back in time. And because of this, China ends up inheriting certain part of their assets. For example, Sri Lanka since it was unable to pay back the debt, hence the Hambantota port of Sri Lanka is under a 99 year lease with China. So considering the debt trap policy, G7 countries have emphasized transparency as the cornerstone for the PGII projects. And accordingly, PGII aims to build projects through grants and investments. Now regarding BRI, India had opted out of China's BRI as India was wary of Beijing's aim to increase its influence in the Indian Ocean region. However, with respect to PGII, a project is already announced in India. So India will also receive funds for infrastructural development through the PGII. So these can be said to be a comparative analysis of Belt and Road Initiative and the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Thus this article on text and context section becomes important and gets covered under GS Paper 2 with respect to global groupings and agreements involving India or affecting India's interest. Now the last news to be taken up also appears on page number 10 in the text and context section. So this says China's interventions in the Horn of Africa. Is Beijing moving away from its policy of non-intervention in Africa and how are different African states reacting to these developments? So China as a part of its foreign policy is now trying to influence the African countries including the Horn of Africa. And recently China conducted the China Horn of Africa Peace Governance and Development Conference in which China highlighted that it aims to play a role in area of security. And the conference was held in Ethiopia and it also witnessed participation of foreign ministries from countries such as Kenya, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, South Sudan and even Uganda. So from our examination perspective, we need to understand not only about the growing Chinese influence in Africa, but also how it will counter India's influence in Africa. So recently, China's focus in Africa is mainly with respect to infrastructure investment controlling the pandemic, implementing a forum on China-Africa cooperation outcomes and upholding common interest while fighting hegemonic politics. Now this has been highlighted by the foreign minister of China. And recently China and African countries have adopted four important resolutions including the Dakar Action Plan, China-Africa Cooperation Vision of 2035, the Sino-African Declaration on Climate Change and declaration of the 8th ministerial conference of FOCAC that is forum on China Africa cooperation and these resolutions cover developments in the area of medical and health reducing poverty in Africa agricultural developments participating in trade promotion investment promotion and also digital innovation so as a part of 2035 vision for China Africa cooperation it highlights that it aims to transform health sector, alleviate poverty, promote trade and investment and also expand digital innovation. And the vision also focuses on green development, capacity building, improving people to people exchanges and facilitating peace and security in the continent. Now China's interest in Africa is majorly related to four major areas. These includes infrastructure, these includes financial assistance. These includes abundance of natural resources in Africa and maritime interest. So China is interested to develop the infrastructure within Africa such as developing the Addis Djibouti railway line connecting the landlocked country with Eritrean ports in the Red Sea, Mombasa Nairobi rail link in Kenya and has also delivered on railway projects in Sudan, military hardware market in Ethiopia and has built over 80 infrastructure projects in Somalia including hospitals, roads, schools and stadiums. 
Now regarding financial assistance, Ethiopia is one of the top five African recipients of Chinese investments. However, also has a debt of almost 14 billion dollars. Now China accounts for 67 percent of Kenya's bilateral debt. And in 2022, China promised to provide 15.7 million dollars assistance to Eritrea. So slowly China is increasing its financial influence over the African countries through these infrastructural projects. Now China is also eyeing the natural resources of Africa as Beijing has invested 400 million dollars in Mombasa's oil terminal. It is also interested in minerals such as gold, iron ore, precious stones, chemicals, oils and natural gas in Ethiopia. And it has continued investment in South Sudan which is a source for petroleum products. Now regarding maritime interest, China's first and only military base outside its mainland is in Djibouti. And the foreign minister of China has hinted to develop Eritrea's coast which would connect China's investments in landlocked Ethiopia. The United States has speculated that China wishes to build another military base in Kenya and Tanzania. And because of this, China is increasing its military presence in the region. So based on these fears, the US and its allies including G7 countries has initiated the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Now look at this particular question asked in 2021 mains examination in GS paper 2. The question was, if the last few decades were of Asia's growth story, the next few are expected to be of Africa's. In light of the statement, examine India's influence in Africa in recent years. So we understand that since China's influence and investment is growing in Africa, hence it become very important for India to have a clear strategy for India-Africa relationship. And in this perspective, India's Prime Minister outlined India's foreign policy approach towards Africa during his speech at Uganda's parliament. So these are the guiding principles as highlighted by India's Prime Minister with respect to India-Africa relationship. So it says that Africa will be top of India's foreign policy priorities and India will have sustained and regular engagements to intensify and deepen its relations with Africa. India's development partners with Africa will be guided by priorities found by respective African countries. India will also rely on African talent and skill to build local capacity and create local opportunities. Now, India also mentioned that it will keep its market open and make it easier and more attractive for Africa to trade with India. And India will also support its industries to invest in Africa. Now, India will also harness its experience with digital revolution to support Africa's development, improve delivery of public services, extend education and health, spread digital literacy and expand financial inclusion and mainstream the marginalized section of Africa. Further, it says that India will also collaborate with Africa to address issues of climate change. India will strengthen its cooperation and enhance mutual capabilities in combating terrorism and extremism. And it will also collaborate towards cybersecurity. It further says that India will work with African countries to keep the oceans open and free for the benefit of all countries. And India will work with Africa to ensure cooperation and not competition in eastern shores of Africa and eastern Indian Ocean. Further, India will collaborate with Africa to ensure that it does not turn into a theater of rival ambitions. And India will work together for a just, representative and democratic global order. And accordingly, India will seek reforms in global institutions with an equal place for Africa. So these are part of India's foreign policy approach towards Africa. Now, despite this policy approach and in face of increased Chinese investment, there are certain issues with India's approach towards Africa. So first point highlighted here is India's model of development cooperation in Africa lacks a clear strategy as compared to China. It further says that in the absence of a clear and well articulated vision for Africa, India's development cooperation is often compared to the Chinese model of development cooperation in the region. Another issue highlighted is that India is not actively pursuing any specific developmental goals. Now the fourth point is that line of credits have not been designed to achieve larger development goals such as food security, health security, clean energy or education for all. So instruments such as line of credits, grants and even capacity building initiatives operate as a stand alone instrument and there is no coherence with respect to a clear strategy for Africa. Now another area of concern is that implementation has been key constraints for India's line of credits with poor dispersal rates and project completion records. 
So India needs a clear strategy with respect to developing various sectors in Africa and also to seek a collaborative agreement with different African countries. Thus this article becomes important both from a prelims and mains perspective and gets covered under GS paper 2 with respect to global agreements affecting India's interest. Now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is consider the following statements regarding PC Mahalanobis. First, he established National Sample Survey in 1950 and also set up the Central Statistical Organization to coordinate statistical activities in India. Second, he led the first planning commission which emphasized on heavy industries. So the question is which of the statements given above is our correct? Options are A one only, B two only, C both one and two and D neither one nor two. Now coming to the answer of yesterday the question was consider the following statements first india has not signed any free trade agreement with any arab nation no this statement is incorrect as india has signed a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with uae the second statement is uae is the largest trading partner of india in west asia yes this statement is correct so the question was which of the statements given above is are correct hence the correct answer becomes b that is two only with this we come to an end to today's discussion thank you for watching dns